Power Herald is an interesting archetype because it is a lot of fun to play and it's very strong but it never really changes and yet it remains such a high skill cap build and it feels like I'm learning a lot every time I play it. So for world versus world roaming it can be a punishing build to play but it can be very fun because the odds are against you in a lot of cases. So the reason why Rev is so difficult is because it only has one stun break per stance so you can be focused down easily and it makes you kind of vulnerable in a lot of situations and also because the skills that you use have cooldowns and they also have energy costs so you have to manage two resources at the same time which makes Rev a very difficult class to get into. So we're going to go into the skill priorities and combos later but for now let's just go over the traits. So in Devastation I take Aggressive Agility that's just going to help you to not get focused as easily because whenever you use a movement skill like Death Strike, Phase Traversal, Unrelenting Assault, or Surge of the Mist, you'll remove Immobilize and that's just going to help you survive better when you're focused. Notoriety which is going to give you more might and might is going to give you more power and there are kind of like two variants to this build. You can take the Notoriety version and then take Incense Response and Shared Empowerment and that'll give you a lot of might. You can get up to like 25 might during your bursts which can give you a lot of damage but it is kind of like a lot of investment to go all three of those might traits. What you can do is go Assassin's Presence and then go Rapid Flow and Shining Aspects for a little bit more sustain and then Assassin's Presence also gives your team ferocity while also giving you the ferocity. So it's kind of like comparable in damage, but if you do want to go full damage, you can go for the Notoriety plus all the other stuff. Dance of Death, which is going to give you battle scars for each application of vulnerability you give out. So you've got Jade Winds gives out 10 vulnerability, and it's an AoE, so it can give out you know a lot of... Uh, battle scars because the max is 25 on battle scars so you'd max out battle scars if you hit three targets with jade winds and what battle scars does is it gives you lifesteal on your attacks so it's better for like application of damage and revenant has quite a bit of application of damage and aoe which would proc multiple applications of dance of death or battle scars and you've also got shackling wave to 12 vulnerability can be aoe You've got your Call of the Assassin, 8 vulnerability, which can also be AoE. So Dance of Death allows you to scale up in World vs. World, where it's not always going to be a small scale situation, and you can just sustain from hitting more targets, and you can stay in those fights longer and really wreak havoc. In Invocation, you will have Cleansing Channel, just giving you more Condi Cleanse, because that's really necessary, or Revenants, because that's one of their weaknesses. You have extra damage when you have Fury, but you're pretty much going to have Fury all the time because you have so many ways to get it. I take Incense Response, but as I said, you could take Rapid Flow. And Contain Temper will also give you yeah, just more Fury. Then you have Call of the Assassin, which is whenever you swap Legends, you'll do an attack nearby. So you'll give yourself Quickness and give vulnerability to enemies that you hit nearby when you swap into Shiro and you will give enemies I think burning and chill when you swap into glint stance so chill is really good on this build because it helps you stick to the target and then in herald you have rising momentum this is just nice because you're not always going to have swiftness on you especially because the way that you get swiftness is from elemental blast and this is such a strong ability to use the active for that you often want to use it and that means that you're not going to get your swiftness for much longer so you can get movement speed from rising momentum and then you get shared empowerment for extra might pulsing or you can use shining aspects which will give you a heal when you use a facet consume it's really not a lot but if you're in a situation where you're like solo it can make the difference between surviving and not surviving 
and then you've got extra damage for each boon that you have. You give out tons of boons, so you're going to give yourself extra damage all the time. And Draconic Echo is very important because it will make your facet passives continue to pulse out boons for 6 seconds after you've already consumed them. So you have the Glint facets and they all have really powerful effects but the boons that they give are also very good. So if you're constantly pulsing out boons, you're not only keeping your shared empowerment pulsing because whenever you gain a boon you also gain might, but you're also giving out your yourself like really strong boons. So might over time, whenever you use facet of strength, you're giving yourself might. So you're constantly following through with the might generation after you use facet of strength. And it kind of synergizes well with facet of strength because the skill itself gives you a five second damage boost of 7% damage. So it's really nice for following through with like your entire burst combo. And then for example, Facet of Darkness is going to keep giving you Fury, which is going to keep procking Incense Response, which is going to keep giving you more Might. So it's just really good for keeping your Might generation, mostly the Draconic Echo, but also giving you Regen uptime and giving you Protection uptime as well, because Facet of Chaos, which gives you Protection, is very powerful but also very costly. So if you just pop out the Facet Chaotic Release, you still got the protection pulse in, which can be very powerful. So your F2 is also a passive, and pretty much only want to use it when you're in Shiro. It'll give you a lifesteal passive, so you'll keep giving out this passive AoE to your allies, as well as yourself, of giving lifesteal to your attacks. So you've got lifesteal on your Dance of Death, you've got lifesteal on the Draconic Echo from your Facet of Nature while in Shiro, and you've also got lifesteal from enchanted daggers, so you've got a lot of ways to survive through sustaining by hitting the enemy on this building. The equipment I take is full berserker armor and full berserker weapons. I have a magi staff because usually when you're in staff you want to be kiting and giving the extra healing power and vitality. Can be nice. And then I have a berserker back piece, a berserker amulet, and then marauder. Uh, trinkets on the accessories and rings so you pretty much want to just go full damage on this build and then a little bit of marauders here and there because you know you don't want to be too squishy and you do have a lot of health gaining sources because in the herald trait line you have 10% extra health and then you also have the rune of durability which is going to give you another 10% of your maximum health so you gain quite a bit of synergy from vitality on this build and it can make you less susceptible to getting bursted down. The extra survivability that you get helps you to stay in fights longer which helps you to get out your damage more often. So that's pretty much the idea. So I just go for like 74% crit chance when I have fury and that's pretty much good enough for me. You can go for more crit chance by going more Marauders, but that's also less burst damage because you have less ferocity and power. So you want to find a good balance. I like 74%. Then you go for Air Sigil and Hydromancy on your double sword. And Hydromancy is really important because it will proc any kind of like energy or cleansing or just a swap sigil in general. Will proc when you swap Legend if it's off the internal cooldown by then. So what you can do is when you're in sword, most of your damage is when you're in sword. So what you want to do is swap legend during your burst combos and then it'll add in hydromancy which chill to help you stick to the target and make it harder for them to use their skills. But also just adds a huge nuke because hydromancy hits for quite a bit. So air is just more DPS and hydromancy is for more burst. And then on the staff you have Cleansing Energy, which is like the same idea, but when you're kiting and in a situation where you can't really do damage to the enemy, you kind of just camp your staff, and then you keep getting the Cleansing and Energy Sigil by swapping Legends instead of swapping weapons, because when you swap weapon, you don't get the effect of the weapon that you just swapped out of. So then you've got to wait another 9 seconds to get the effect. So often what you do is when you're kiting, 
and playing defensively, you just camp your staff and use your, you know, your facets or your Shiro abilities to do damage if you really want to add a little counter pressure. And then when you want to swap gears and go aggressive, then you swap into the sword and then if you want to stay aggressive, then you only swap legends. So you kind of have to manage your weapon swapping and your legend swapping as well as your energy and cooldowns. And that's why it's kind of complicated to play the Revenant. And the food I would use is just the power ferocity food that you can get, the spicy butternut squash soup. So your staff skills are pretty strong at keeping you alive. So your one skill is actually more damage than your one skill on sword. So generally that's nice to use. It'll also create these little orbs on the ground which you can pick up and that'll give you healing. So you can pick up this orb if you use the final attack here. Your two skill, Mender's Rebuke, gives out weakness and it will heal you if it hits and it will heal you for a little bit less if it doesn't hit. So often when you're just kiting, you can use it just kind of like heal yourself. And it's a 5 energy cost, so it's kind of worth it to do that. And it'll also give weakness to the targets that you hit with it, so it's pretty strong at surviving. Then you've got Warding Rift, gives you a block for 2 seconds, and it will blind at the end. So what you want to do is time it so that you turn around to your target right as the block is ending and blind them so that you not only block their attacks, but you blind their attacks. Then you've got Renewing Wave, which is 15 energy, so it's not that high priority, but it is high value because you cleanse two conditions and heal yourself for quite a bit. And it's a combo finisher blast, so that's important to know for like stealthing with your allies and stuff like that. So then you have Surge of the Mist, which is a pretty strong attack. It is high cost, but it will do a lot of CCs and evade so it's good at like getting you out of bad situations but it's also a good combo enabler because you can CC them for a little bit and then land one of your higher CCing abilities and then your combo kind of just flows through from there so it's a nice combo enabler. Then you have sword. In sword you have your auto attack which gives vulnerability which gives you battle scars so it's kind of nice for your sustain but it is less damage than your staff which also gives you sustain. Then you've got Chilling Isolation, so the kind of idea with sword skills is that they're better versus single targets. So if I use Chilling Isolation and hit all of these targets, it will do less damage spread out. That's kind of good to use, mainly because it's such a low energy cost, so it's high priority because you can just spam it out and it doesn't really cost much. Then you've got Unrelenting Assault. This is 15 energy, so it's still pretty high priority because it's so strong, but it is very costly gives you an evade and it gives you kind of like this high damaging attack but it's only really good damage against single targets because it spreads it out among multiple so you want to isolate someone out and then use unrelenting but if they're nearby allies then yeah it's going to spread out the damage so mostly it's just good for the evade in bigger fights and then in like 1v1s it's a big damaging high momentum ability and then you have shackling wave this is kind of medium in the cost because it's 10 energy, but it is pretty good because it gives vulnerability and immobilize, which can help you to set up your combos for like Death Strike, which is a it's a 10 energy cost as well. So if you're doing Shackling Wave into Death Strike, that's pretty costly. So generally, yeah, you want to do that in Dragon Stance. And what Death Strike will do is port you to a target and then you'll do a hit and then you'll do a second hit right after if the first one hits. So you don't want to move away immediately after landing your first death strike hit because you really want to hit the second one because the first one does no damage. It doesn't really say on the tooltip how much it does. And death strike is also just good for kiting because you can just reposition if you get a target on someone far away. So let's talk about the stances. So the kind of idea with all of the skills that you're using is depending on their cost you want to use them in a certain stance so in assassin stance you have a lot of costly utilities and in glint stance you don't have costly utilities because to activate them costs nothing but to pulse them costs something so if i just throw out my glint abilities i'm basically using no energy 
So in Glint, you are often way more budgeted for your energy gain. And for that reason, you can use these more costly abilities like Unrelenting Assault in Glint stands. So when you swap stance, you go to 50 energy, and then while you're in combat, you will keep gaining energy. So this idea of like pooling energy is pretty important because when you are about to swap stance, you want to throw out all of your abilities, and then you swap stance when you get as low energy as possible, and then you renew your energy to 50. So it gives you these high momentum shifts as soon as you swap legend. And if you are trying to swap stance and you've got high energy, you can often lose value because you could use all these skills. So often what I like to do in Shiro stance, you're generally going to be low on energy anyways in Shiro stance. But if you pool energy in Shiro stance, you can often do massive combos because those skills are so costly. So what you'll do is you'll, if you're in like a situation where you can't go in right now, what you'll do is instead of sitting in glint stance, you'll sit in shiro stance because then you can open up a combo and say if you wait until you get 100 energy, you can do massive like phase traversal and then you can have your um, impossible odds up that entire time, which is going to make all of your damage just scale up that much more. So shiro stance is really strong at giving you your combo potential. And then Glint is powerful at letting you use your skills freely and sustaining. So let's go into what the skills actually do. So the heal skill on Shiro is Enchanted Daggers. You use this mostly aggressively or like before your burst. So like what I do is Enchanted Daggers and then I'll pour it in and do my damage. And then every time you hit a target, you will send out a dagger. And those daggers do quite a bit of damage, 1000 in lifesteal then it'll heal you for like 700 so if you hit all of those daggers it can give you quite a bit of healing but if the enemy evades then you lose those so you generally want to use the daggers in a situation where you can get value out of them from actually healing but also from doing damage then you have reposting shadows which is pretty high cost it's 40 energy one of the highest energy costs in the game and it will give you your stun break and it will remove movement inhibiting conditions. So the reason why this is a strong skill is because it's an evade and a stun break, but it is such a high energy cost that if you use this, you're generally not able to do anything else unless you pool energy very well. So you're gonna hear this a lot, is pooling energy is basically gaining energy by either using very low energy cost skills and budgeting your energy very wisely to not waste it and then that'll allow you to use your higher cost skills more freely or just not using anything in general and kiting and waiting for the right moment and gaining energy during that time. So that's kind of what I mean by pooling energy. So next is phase reversal. This is 35 energy cost. It will port you to the target, 1200 range give you quickness and give you unblockable on your next two attacks and it also does a decent amount of damage. This is probably your best skill in Shiro because it helps you to not only get to your target and basically chase things that are trying to kite you or range classes, but it also gives you quickness which allows you to just like pump out damage which is pretty convenient because when you port to a target that's really when you want to have quickness. So it's like all the stuff you want to have at the same time from one skill and then you have impossible odds very costly ability you generally don't want to use impossible odds because the amount of value that it gives you for how much cost it has is pretty low i'd rather use phase reversal than have impossible odds up for like 10 seconds because impossible odds yes it's good but in general it's better to have quickness because that'll give you damage too so if you look at impossible odds I lose energy very quickly and it has a 10 second immediate cost so yeah it is very costly but because it is kind of like a channel you can choose how much energy you're using and often when you're about to swap out of shiro stance into the glint you're going to lose that energy anyways and get it back from going to glint so i often like to use impossible odds near the end of my shiro rotations 
rather than at the beginning. You usually never want to use impossible odds as soon as you swap into Shiro because then it just lowers the amount of things that you can do. And if you use it near the end, well then you can pretty much just swap out anyways, right? So the extra damage that you get from impossible odds is kind of nice. And impossible odds has a one fourth second kind of like internal cooldown. So it's better to use it with quicker attacks. Then you have Jade Winds. This is definitely the most costly elite skill here. You have a 50 energy cost. And what it will do is this wide AoE at 600 radius and it will stun all five targets that it hits for three seconds. That is a massive ability and it'll give 10 vulnerability so you can do a lot of damage afterwards and it's such a like strong ability because even though it's so costly if you get hit by jade winds and you don't have a stun break it doesn't matter how much it costs you're dead right you can often punish a revenant if they use jade winds and then you dodge it but if you don't dodge jade winds then you might be dead right so it is a very risky ability to use not because it's like a hard ability to use but because it's a costly ability to use because if you use Jade Winds, well then you don't have Reposting Shadows, right? So yeah, there is a trade-off there to this strong ability. But as I said, if you pool energy, you can often land these large combos with Jade Winds tied in there. So let's go over the Glint abilities. You have Fast of Light, so all the Glint abilities you need to... Basically there's two parts to them. You have the Channel, which makes you lose energy regeneration but then you gain a boon and then you use the active which has no cost to it and then will give you a stronger effect and then will it'll stop the the boons pulsing after six seconds because of draconic echo making it persist for another six seconds so infuse light will give you basically damage inversion so all the damage that you take condition and power will be transferred into healing instead and that's just super strong because in world versus world where people aren't really paying attention to what buffs everyone has on them you can often just have people just free casting on you and you'll get a full heal most of the time when you use a skill and it really just puts no limit on the amount of healing you can do so you often want to like in a dangerous situation you want to precast your facet of light because it has a cast time, so if you're CC'd, you can't cast the the first part, which means you can't use the instant cast second part. And you can die there, so if you think you're in a situation where you could potentially get CC'd to death, you want to pre-cast the Fast of Light, and then that'll allow you to use the Infuse Light while you're CC'd. When you're in like a small scale situation, and people are trying to play around that, you can often get them to stop doing damage to you because you have that prepared. And they're gonna say well I don't want to throw my damage out onto them because if they use infused light then they're just gonna full heal so they're backing off and that can allow you to play more aggressively just because you put on the facet of light you may have no intention of using the infused light but they don't know when you're gonna use it they can bait it out or you can take advantage of skills that have like you lose control of the ability for example like facet of elements i throw it out there and then it pulses damage so if the enemy revenant uses facet of elements i can stand in that and purposefully take damage but that'll be inverting into healing so it's such a strong ability for players who know what they're playing against and that's why revenant is kind of like a hard class to play because making use of infused light when you're a good player can be super powerful and when you're like a new player who doesn't know what skills are doing damage and when to use infuse light it can almost do nothing so this is a super important skill to get used to then you have facet of darkness which pulses fury which makes it better than the pulsing might because the pulsing fury if you have incense response just gives you might instead so if you want more might you just do both of these but the fury can be better if you don't have fury but generally you always have fury so when you activate facet of darkness you will do a large aoe that does pretty much no damage but you will blind and give vulnerability so this is pretty good to just 
it's kind of risky to do this but if you're in the middle of like a CC combo where you're trying to one shot someone you just put out facet of darkness and use the active to get vulnerability on the target which is going to give you more damage and it is a stun break so if you do use your stun break to do damage you kind of have to deal with the consequences if you get cc'd and it's also a reveal so if there are like thieves that you know that are nearby within like 600 range you'll reveal them for five seconds and that can be very devastating because if a revenant is on top of you and you can't go into stealth they're going to be doing a lot of damage. Then you have Facet of Strength. This is going to just pulse might and it gives you a strong kind of like double attack that's kind of wide range in front of you that will also give you burst of strength which is just a 7% damage modifier. And then you've got Facet of Elements. This gives you swiftness and when you cast it out on a location it will pulse out weakness then chill then burning. So generally the most powerful one of those is the chill on the second tick, but the burning even on a power build will still do a lot of damage on the final tick. So weakness is nice if you're getting attacked by like a thief, you want to put the facet of elements right on top of them. If you're being chased, you want to put the facet of elements a little bit in front of them so that the second tick will hit them. And then if you want to just do damage to like a downstate body, then just put the facet of elements on it and you do tons of damage. So it's a really good skill for like zoning people. If they don't want to eat all of those like debilitating conditions, they're often going to walk through it or move around it. And that means that instead of going straight to you, they're going to go somewhere else. And that can potentially be the difference between you getting away if they want to go through your elements or them not. And they're going to get chilled anyways if they go through it. So it's just a really strong ability. It's pretty low cooldown. So. Often people just spam out elements, but because it's such a strong ability, you often want to get high value out of it. You've got the Facet of Chaos Pulse Out Protection, and then you can use it, which is like this large dragon animation, and it will knock away enemies, and it will give super speed to allies that are in front of you. So you can use it to support your allies to give them super speed to help them get out, or you can use it sort of like as a bait because it's such a wide animation that if you stow it, they can't really know whether you stowed it or not. And yeah, it's just such a strong ability because the CC effect is so good for setting up like your combos here. You will gain Facet of Nature, which depends on which stances you have. So while I'm in Shiro stance, I will gain Facet of Nature, Shiro, or Assassin. And this will give out basically Lifesteal Aura to myself and allies. So I have Dance of Death for Lifesteal and I have the Shiro passive and it's a decent amount of Lifesteal but mostly you want to use True Nature for the boon removal and unblockable damage when you use the active effect because not only will it do that but because of Draconic Echo you will also have that passive effect right after. So often when I'm doing a burst combo I'll start out with the True Nature in Shiro, which will remove boons, do damage, and then allow my next attacks that follow to gain extra damage from that lifesteal. So you use the kind of like AoE there, and as you can see here, I've got the Facet of Nature Assassin, and there are just so many little pulses of lifesteal going out there. In the middle of a fight, I feel like the Shiro stance with Staff is a little bit safer because when you're in Shiro, you only have Reposting Shadows and then you're pretty much dead. So having Staff as well allows you to be a little bit safer and not get focused as easily. Whereas when I'm in Glint, I can be in Sword and feel more safe because the Sword Weapon Set really doesn't give you any defense other than Unrelenting Assault. So it's nice to feel safer with the Facet of Light and all the other utility that you get from the Glint Stance. So I generally like to be in those. But there are some combos that will allow you to go beyond those kind of like basic swap synergies. So the first combo I'm going to show is starting out with Shiro and Sword. So those are the two most aggressive options you've got. So you open with Shiro and Sword because you've already got all of your weapon swap and your stance swap off cooldown. So it's very safe. You can just swap out if things go wrong. And if you go into Glint, right, that's more defensive, and if you go into Staff, that's more defensive. That's why I like to mix those two. 
but since I'm opening up here, I can just go as aggressively as possible. I'm going to start out with Enchanted Daggers, and then you'll pour it in with Phase Traversal, and then use your True Nature in Shiro, which will give you boon removal, damage, and more lifesteal. So you've got lifesteal here from your Battle Scars from Exposed Defenses, and you'll get it from Facet of Nature as well, so that's a lot of lifesteal doing a lot more damage. And then you'll immediately use one of your sword abilities. If it's single target, you want to start out with Unrelenting Assault. If it's AoE, you want to start out with Shackling Wave or your Chilling Isolation. You can use Impossible Odds at any point in the Shiro part of this rotation, depending on how much energy you have. But if you're starting from out of combat, you're going to have 50 energy, which means Phase Traversal is going to put you at 15, and then Unrelenting is going to put you at 0. So you pretty much can only use two abilities there. But if you got more, then you can use impossible odds. And then you will immediately, as soon as you get off your unrelenting assault, you will use your dragon stance. And then from there, you'll be ending your sword three or sword four. And then you can use your facets and the rest of your sword abilities with basically no cost because your glint stance is gonna give you a lot of energy. So here is the combo. Go in, port, do that, sword three, go into glint, and then you can use the rest of your sword abilities with passive elements, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Another combo that you can do is kind of like a CC chain combo that allows you to get maximum value out of your passive elements. So what you'll do is say you're in a situation where you can get chased by someone, and you want to turn around and counter pressure them. So what you can do is facet of chaos and then use it while like facing the other way and then turn around and then hit them. And then what you'll do is you'll facet of elements on top of them. And usually because you're kiting, you'll be low on energy. So you want to swap immediately to Shiro and then Jade wins them into your facet of elements and then go into sword in melee range, which will hydromancy proc them and then do all your sword stuff. So that'll look something like this. So you get in chase, do the facet elements, Jade win them in it, and then sword, and then use your F2, and then go into the rest of your sword combo. And often, because a revenant is staying in fights for a long time, you're going to not just do one burst combo, you're going to be flowing through different kinds of combos that you want to do. So for example, I could start out doing this combo, right? And then from there, I'm going to be low on energy. I swap while in my sword to the glint stance because that'll give me my hydro proc, which will do a nice burst. And then from there, I can throw all of my facets and sword skills. I'll probably go into my staff just because I'm out of sword skills anyways and I want to gain the value of the energy and the cleansing sigil or just to kite until some of my other stuff is off cooldown. And while I'm in the staff anyways, I can use a bunch of my facets and it won't matter that I'm in the sword or not. Then what I'll want to do is decide whether I want to swap into my Shiro stance or into my sword first. Because if I swap into my sword, then I will get more value out of the swapping sigils. Or I can swap my stance and that'll give me more value out of the defense. So it depends on the situation a lot based on if you're in danger or if you're trying to get a kill whether you want to be in staff or you want to be in sword so from here i could be in your staff is pretty good for uh, setting up combos so i could be doing this and then from there i could glint them into the jade wins combo and then i use the hydro swap on them while they're in the cc and then from there i'm in a very dangerous weapon set so i probably don't want to be using many of my sword skills. I want to just be you know, getting energy. So I'll probably use Unrelenting Assault and then I'll probably just auto attack or just kite. And then from there, I'll maybe I'll just pull energy. I'll do another combo there with the Shiro. And then I'll swap into Glint, stay in Glint to get some momentum from the sword. And then maybe I'll stay in for another swap. What I can do here is I can do a massive combo. So I can do Gaze of Darkness into Chilling Isolation into Swap to Shiro and that'll give me a lot of vulnerability 
and a massive hydro proc on top of my chilling isolation which can do basically a lot of damage into one animation and yeah from there you just want to pretty much decide what you are trying to do if you're trying to play safe you pull energy or you go into staff or glint and you, if you want to just do burst combos often just swapping legend while in sword is good and otherwise yeah it's all just kind of situational and getting used to the flow of a build here's an opener versus a permastel thief i get a really good shiro combo on them and they're forced to go in stealth now when they're in stealth I have to play not to avoiding their backstab, but rather to making it as awkward as possible for them to backstab. So using terrain or putting down AoE so that they have to trade with me when they backstab me, or putting my back to a wall so that they actually can't get the backstab bonus, they have to front stab me, is what you want to do versus like a permacell thief or you want to just run away. So I land a really good sword 3 here and they panic and sh they shadow step too soon and that allows me to get the kill. I jade wins from max range here so that I don't get blinded and I see that I'm getting retail there so I'm definitely hitting them still. Now I am chasing the other perma stealth thief and I miss my reveal and I use my heal just to play as aggressively as possible because if I save my heal too much, well, a thief is just going to be able to abuse that anyways. I chase them into the terrain area down here, and they get a really good shadow shot on me. So I am playing very defensively, but they steal to me from above, and they don't really get too much out of it because I'm moving in an awkward way that makes it hard for them to melee me, so they swap to Sharpo and just try to poke me down. So I, I pour through the wall, and... I pop my heal and play as aggressively as possible because I know that they can't hit me. And I was backpedaling there so that they couldn't backstab me from behind, which allows them to get more damage. And yeah, I land a lot of CC, but they have a lot of their stun breaks still. And they're just going to play as passively as possible because all they have to do is out sustain me. So I have to play as aggressively as possible. However, it's not really easy to do that against a perma stealth thief. So now that I'm this far behind, they don't really need to play as passively. They have the advantage. So now I have to play passively, but since they're a permastel thief, I can't really get the advantage back ever. So I do see that they were going to steal to me there, and now I'm super, super low. But I am just counter pressuring as much as possible because I could potentially get a kill if they're playing uh, very aggressively to finish me off. And just using the terrain here, counter pressuring. They don't really do a lot of damage because they're so heavily invested into durability and being a permacell thief. So I am able to survive. But in the end, I decide if they're going to be a permacell thief and not interact with me, then I'm not going to interact with them. And so I go back into my keep. Here's a situation where I am going to enter into a fight. I open up with my staff instead of my sword so that I can bait out some cooldowns first and I immediately swap into sword to do my burst but they block it all so now I just throw a lot of my facets into the fight to AoE and I land a really good shackling wave but I have to back off because I don't have any cooldowns left and I'm noticing I'm getting focused so as soon as the guardian poured it on me there I use my infuse light and then just counter pressure because since all the damage that I take becomes healing, there's no reason for me to kite anymore. So I get the kill there, and now the next target, I pulled a little bit of energy so that I could port on them and do my sword swap for a little bit of burst. And now I am just throwing my facets into the team fight again. I have my heal up, and I'm going to use that because I have a bunch of conditions on me, and I'm getting CC'd. And I am trying to stay on the target, I get a nice double down here and I have to cleave safely because I am getting focused here. I get CC'd and I just keep auto attacking with my staff here while I'm getting basically everyone focusing me here. And I do get jumped on by the guardian here, so the guardian ports on me and I get downed. But 
my teammates are here they can revive me and I'm able to counter pressure and use my elite there to just focus the target as fast as possible. Now here we're just finishing up and I do a massive shackling wave into my Shiro swap because that gave extra Volm and just made my burst do that much more damage. Here is a one v one versus a soul beast. Soul beasts are very difficult to fight as revenants because if you can't stick to them, then you don't get your sustain. Anything like a thief or a ranger, which isn't going to trade with you, they're going to try to knock you down, CC you, and then back off when you aren't CC'd. You're going to lose a lot of your sustain, and then they're going to back off when you use your infused light. So it's going to be hard to do damage. So in this 1v1, I have to stick to the target as aggressively as possible. I pull some energy, but I get knocked back after I pour it back in, so I'm in a very bad situation right now. I have pretty much nothing. I swap into Glint, I get the reveal on the Ranger, which is pretty good, but they go into the water, and I have basically no chance of killing them in the water. So I decide to back out after realizing this, and I go back on land. But I'm far behind now, so I, I'm i preparing for them to come out of the water, but yeah, I'm far behind and I have to use my Staff 5 to get in melee range, but now I'm out of a lot of stuff. I use my Infuse Light, which I pre-casted, and my, I use Jade Winds there to try to bait out some of their cooldowns, but Rangers usually have tons of stun breaks, so it doesn't do much. But progressing the kill is important, so a stun break is worth it for sure even though I lost a lot of energy for that. I'm just staying on them to try to trade, but yeah, I don't want to eat too much damage because I'm not sure of when I can get it back, my health. And here I do another Jade Winds. They do have their barrier up now, so I'm just gonna pool energy. There's no reason for me to throw damage into that. And then I pour it in again. I want to use my Sword 3 on them, but they block it and I get a really good sword too in before their damage but they're not taking a lot of damage as you can see they have just, you know, soul beasts in general in World of the World are just so tanky for free and I get a block here on most of their burst damage but yeah I reveal them as well so that stealth didn't get them much value I'm able to get a jade winds again but as usual they have a stun break so getting stuns on them isn't necessarily good but baiting out their barrier so that I can do my damage is good. And then here I just throw out yeah a lot of my facets to counter pressure and I eventually get the kill. So yeah, that's pretty much how you want to play the Power Herald. It's a very fun build, a very difficult build, but a very rewarding build once you get used to it. So if you like this kind of video, give it a like and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you.